talk about a couple more applications for the derivative as a rate of change. And so for this first one, let's take a look at motion in a gravitational field. So let's suppose that we throw a stone vertically upward with some initial velocity, 64 feet per second, off of a bridge that is 96 feet um, above a river. And so I drew a little, uh, it is a very rudimentary sketch over here, but I drew a little sketch. Here we are um, standing on a bridge and we throw a stone off of the bridge and it comes back down and hits hits the water okay so that's the idea 96 feet above the water it has that initial velocity of 64 feet per second and by newton's laws of motion the height of the stone above the river can be modeled by this function so s of t by the way is um, in feet and this is feet above river and t is time after thrown after throw. Now, a couple of things, you know, Newton's Newton's laws of motion um, on Earth, of course, depend on gravity. And you can see that that initial velocity is right here. This negative 16 does have to do with gravity, and we can get into that more when we talk about antiderivatives. And notice that the constant in this quadratic is actually that height above the water that we're starting at. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump in here and start by first finding the velocity and the acceleration function. So the velocity function, remember, is the derivative of the position function. So the derivative of the position function is going to be negative 32t plus 64. And then the acceleration function, let's remember that that is the derivative of the velocity. It's the rate of change in the velocity uh, with respect to time. Or if we want to, we can also say that is the second derivative. Since the velocity is the first derivative of the position, acceleration is the second derivative. And notice that that comes out as a constant. And so those are our velocity and acceleration functions for this position function. All right. So then comes up the question. Once I have those, we're going to use those to answer a few follow-up questions. For instance, what is the maximum height above the river that the stone reaches. So what is this height right here that the stone reaches on our little picture? What would this point right here be? And if we think about it intuitively, that is the point when the velocity is equal to zero. So this is when V of T is gonna equal zero. That's gonna give me that max height. When we have that horizontal tangent line, equaling zero, when the velocity is equal to zero. So if you want to think about what's happening there is it starts off, right? We throw it upwards with some initial velocity, with some speed, but gravity is decreasing that speed as it goes up until it hits this moment in time when it has no speed. And that's going to happen if that, um, at that max height, at that, that top, the apex of that um, curve, that that throw. And so it's going to hit that point where it's going to have a velocity equal to zero, and then it's going to start to be pulled back down to earth, back down to the water using that gravitational pull. Well, as that happens, it's going to gain velocity in a negative way. So it's going to speed up. It's going to have a higher speed. It's just in a negative way because it's falling back down to earth at this point. So that's going to happen. If we want to know when the max height is for this curve, this uh, dictated by Newton's laws of motion with gravity, we're going to be looking at where the velocity is equal to zero. So we have to come back and figure out what that height is. But the first thing we're going to have to do is figure out this is going to occur, occurs when the velocity equals zero. So we're going to take our velocity function, which we already have, and we're going to set it equal to zero. So velocity is negative 32t plus 64. We're going to set that equal to zero. So negative 32t equals negative 64, and t is 2. So this is actually going to occur after two seconds. That doesn't answer the question, what is the max height? So now what we have to do is we actually have to plug that in to find the max height. So now we're going to plug that into the position function. So we're going to plug t equals 2 seconds into the position or height function. function. So we need to plug that in. So s of 2 is going to be negative 16 times 2 squared plus 64 times 2 plus 
96. So I'm plugging it just into there. I know it's right off the top of the screen there, but plus 96. And so we end up with um, negative 64 plus 128 plus 96, and we get 160 feet is the max height above the water. And it's occurring at two seconds. Okay, that wasn't part of the question, but two seconds after it is thrown, it hits that max height above the water. That's when its uh, velocity is equal to zero. Okay, so then let's answer the second question, or I, I guess technically it's actually the third question. When does the stone actually reach the water? And I noticed I, a T got deleted there. When does it actually reach the water? So when does the stone come back down and actually hit the water? So when is this occurring? When is the stone, right, the stone goes up, over time and comes back down and it hits the water. So when is that going to occur? Well, it's going to hit the water when the position is equal to zero. Because remember, the position is the, the amount of feet, the height above the river. So this, it hits the river or the water. It hits the water when the position function, when s of t equals zero. So if we want to know when that occurs, we have to set our position function equal to zero. So when we're going to hit, when we're going to reach the water or hit the water, that's going to happen when s of t equals zero, when it has zero height above the water. So s of t was negative 16 t squared plus 64 t plus 96, and we want to know when is that going to be equal to zero. So that's going to be equal to zero. Uh, well, we'd have to see it's a quadratic, so we'd have to maybe see if it factors. I noticed that these actually all have a common factor of 16, so I'm going to pull off a negative 16. I need to factor it all the way out. Uh, t squared minus 4t minus 6, actually. Um, so we're looking for when does t squared minus 4t minus 6 equals 0, and that does not factor. But no fear. We always have the quadratic formula or completing the square. I'm actually going to go for completing the square here. Um, I always do that after I've pulled off this a, right, as soon as a is 1 here. As soon as I have 1 here, I take a look at this middle term, just kind of a little sidebar here. I take a look at that b value, that middle term, and if it's even, in my estimation, it's easier to complete the square. And so I would definitely probably complete the square here. But, you know, quadratic formula, you know, do it, do what works for you, right? You could go quadratic. It doesn't factor. So either go quadratic formula or complete the square. Kind of a little algebra review here. Um, I always go for whatever seems to be the least number of steps, most effective. So I'm going to add 4 to both sides here, move the 6 over, and now I've got t minus 2 squared equals 10. And take the square root of both sides, so t minus 2 is equal to plus or minus the square root of 10. And t is equal to 2 plus or minus the square root of 10. So t is approximately, I'm just going to pop those into the calculator, t is approximately when I add 5.16 seconds, or uh, when I subtract I get actually a negative, negative 1.16. And so obviously we're not going to go backwards in time, so it hits the water after about 5 seconds. Okay? So it's going to hit the water, so the, the I think it's a stone, the stone Stone hits the water after or at 5.2 or 5.16 seconds after it's thrown. Now, the second, the follow up question was what is the velocity when it hits the water? So let's figure out V of 5.16. So plugging in uh, 5.16 into V, which was negative 32 times 5.16 plus, where is my velocity function? It's kind of off the screen a little bit, plus 64. And we find that its velocity when it hits the water, when I plug that in, is about negative 
0.12. Uh, let's just go, let's round to a whole number, negative 101 feet per second. Remember, velocity is the rate of change of the position over time, and our position is measured in feet and our uh, time is in seconds. And then the acceleration at 5.16. Now, remember that the acceleration is constant throughout this trajectory. Um, so the acceleration, remember, was just negative 32. So even at, it doesn't matter what the time is, the acceleration is always the same. So the acceleration is negative 32 feet per second squared is how we measure the units on the acceleration. Rate of change in the velocity per unit time. So uh, feet per second per second. So that becomes feet per second squared. All right, and those are our two answers. And so there's a little exploration with uh, Newton's law of motion, if I could get it all on the same screen, looking at max, looking at where the max height occurs and using velocity and acceleration to describe a little bit about that stone's throw. Okay, so let's take a look at a second example here on this video. And this one I want to look at, so again, we're exploring derivatives as rates of change, but I want to pull an example out of more of the sciences, more of the natural sciences here, um, and explore what's called a logistic or a bounded growth model. And so this is, you know, we have exponential growth, but exponential growth is, uh, since we know how to take derivatives of exponential, looking at rates of change of exponential growth is pretty simple. Um, I want to look at one with a little bit more complexity. So let's take a look at an exponential growth problem that is a logistic growth um, model or a bounded growth model. So a logistic growth model is where you do experience some exponential growth for a period of time, but then you have some sort of carrying capacity. This is often the case with populations because populations um, in the natural world can't really grow without bound. They tend to have some sort of a carrying capacity, the capacity of the environment um, with which that population is growing can only sustain so much, right? Like, I mean, the easiest example to think about is the world population and the fact that it's unlikely that the world is gonna continue to be able to grow exponentially without bound. Uh, human population is gonna be able to grow without bound. The, the earth can only sustain uh, so many humans. Okay. So that said, that was a little deviation into the sciences, but I grabbed an example here. This is a seal population, um, and there was a government plan in the 70s to reduce, or maybe up until the seven, 1975, to reduce the seal population. They were thought of as a um, invasive species, an invasive predator species. And so there was a plan to reduce their population. That's a nice way to kill off, say, kill off the seal population. And it did, it had greatly reduced the population. And so when those uh, measures were taken away and the population was allowed to rebound, the population did so for a period of time exponentially. And you can see that on the graph. You know, once the measures were taken away, you can see this growth um, having that exponential growth. But of course, the, the environment with which these seals lived in had a capacity. It could only sustain so many of these seals. And so what ended up happening was they kind of have this, this model right here. And it does, you can actually see another little dip. And of course, it's not exact, right? Science doesn't work out as an exact mathematical function, but we can model a function to this called a logistic growth model. And so what happened over time was the seal population, it grew pretty quickly for a period of time, but then it sort of settled into what is probably the the normal, the, the correct environmental number of seals in that location. Okay, I think this was in Washington, but I can't remember exactly. So um, here's the model, and I just developed a little logistic growth model, um, and you can look back into your pre-calculus uh, knowledge on how to write these logistic growth models, but carrying capacity is actually on the top. 7,500 uh, 7, is the carrying capacity for this environment, um, and then I found the other constants with a little bit of algebra. So it, this is our model. So if we have a logistic growth model, that's um, not something I want to spend time in this course talking about coming up with these. I want to say once we have a model, how can we look at it using the calculus that we've learned? So here is a population model where T is the number of years after 1975 and P of T is the population of seals. So this is the population of seals in this environment. 
And again, notice that T is the number of years after 1975 in here. And so that'll be important for us to remember um, when we are, start plugging in values for T, that we don't just plug in the year, we have to do an adjustment from the year 1975. So another way to say that is that 1975 represents T equals zero. That's like the starting. So on this model, this would be zero and 1980 would be five if we were adjusting the graph over here, the small graph I have. Okay. So let's take that seal population and let's work with it. Let's take that model and let's work with it to answer a few questions. So it says, what is the population in 1985? And then it says, at what rate is the population growing? When we're talking about a rate, that is a derivative. So in order to talk about the rate of change, anytime we have a rate of change in some context, a rate of change is going to be the derivative. So we're gonna be looking at P prime of T. Since we're gonna be looking at P prime of T, let's take a minute and let's actually calculate what P prime of T is so that we have both the population model and we have the rate of change model. So let's go ahead off to the side and let's do that. So P prime of T, notice that P of T is can be written, I wanna show you a little trick. We could use quotient rule, but I would rather, I notice that constant in the top, and so I'd actually rather use the little trick where we just write that as um, a constant, 7,500 times one plus 3.6875 e to the negative 0.2x to the negative first. When I do that, when I take a, con you know, if I have a constant over some function like this, that can be written as a constant times that function to the negative first. And whereas here I have to use the quotient rule, and that's totally fine, um, here I end up using just chain rule. And so it's sort of a, it's a matter of choice here, it's a personal preference um, on these two. I'm gonna go with the chain rule, I, I would prefer to just apply the chain rule, um, k to the, times f of x to the negative first, but it's really a matter of personal preference. So you make your choice. If you prefer to use the quotient rule, go for it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and use the chain rule to find the derivative here. So taking the derivative now, p prime of t is going to be negative 7,500. Now I do have to use the chain rule. I've got this one plus, and because it is a real life example, you know, the numbers maybe are we got these decimals we're going to have to carry through, and that's okay. Uh, negative, let's zoom in a little bit, uh, to the negative second. And then I have to keep going <clears throat> with my chain rule. Now I have to take the derivative of the inside. So the derivative of 1 is, of course, just 0. And then the derivative of the exponential with that constant is uh, 3.6875e to the negative 0.2x. And then I have to multiply by the derivative of the inner, uh, the, the actual exponent of the exponential. So the derivative of negative 0.2x is negative 0.2. Okay, so I've got that derivative. Um, I notice here that I've got, let's see if I can get it all back on the screen, there we go. So now I have the derivative. And I notice that I want to simplify this a little bit. And so I notice in the top that I've got negative 7,500 and 3.6875 and negative, point zero two, or negative 0 0.2. And so I'm going to grab the calculator, multiply those all together. It is going to be a positive. And let's see what we end up with. So we end up with 5,531. 5,531.25, we have the e to the negative 0.2x in the numerator, and on the denominator now we have the 1 plus 3.6875 e to the negative 0.2x quantity squared. Okay, so there is my derivative. So that's going to tell me about rates of change, and my function, we can get them both on the same screen here, my function tells me about the population of seals, and this is the rate of change in the population of seals in seal population over time, which is in years. Okay. All right, so now that we have those two functions, so let's highlight those two functions, because one tells us the actual population, 
And the derivative tells us how the population is changing with respect to the measure of time, which is years in our case. So we have the two functions. So now we can answer any follow-up questions that we might want to. So on this one, it says, what is the population in 1985? Well, that's we would need to use the actual population model for that. So we would have use our P of T. So what is the population in 1985? Well, first of all, what is 1985? So 1985 is going to be, uh, well, there's a couple ways to do it. You could just do it in your head if you want to. I think I actually even wrote this one on the graph, but 1985 is 10 years after 1975, so it's going to be when t equals 10. Or you could literally, I was going to put equals, but let's do it this way. Uh, you could literally say 19, how many years have passed? 1985 minus 1975 is going to be 10. So this is when t equals 10, and we need to know, both what the population is, so we're going to plug that in, and what the rate of change is. So it's going to be 7,500 over 1 plus 3.6875. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. 3, uh, so I don't have sloppy writing. 6875e to the negative 0 0.2 times 10. And I took the time to just plug that into the calculator ahead of time. And that comes out when we plug in 10. It comes out to uh, 5,000 and something that I rounded because, of course, we have to have whole number of seals. So it comes out to about 5,000 seals, 5,003 seals when we round to the whole seal. And we would have to round to a whole seal. We're not going to have 0.25 of a seal, right? We're going to round to a whole seal. Okay, and then we also want to know at what rate, right? Well, what's the rate? Well, the rate is P prime of T. So in 1985, what was the rate of change? Well, let's plug that into our derivative. So uh, 5,531.25e to the negative 0 0.2 times 10 and 1 plus 3.6. 875e to the negative 0 0.2 times 10 quantity squared. And what we find out is that, again, I did an approximation here, and this was approximately rounded to a whole seal per year. This was 333, and the units here, of course, are in seals per year. So right at the beginning of 1985, right? Like right at that instant in time. Remember, a derivative is an instantaneous rate of change. So if we wanted like in June of 1985, we would have to do point, you know, we'd have to plug in 10.5. So this is like right at that instant, right in January 1st. What's happening to this population is it is increasing by about 300, it's positive, right? So it's increasing by about 333 seals per year. That's that instantaneous rate of change. So it is increasing, increasing by about 333 seals per year. So the population has reached about 5,000 and it's increasing at 333 per year. And so if we go back to kind of that little graph that we had up here, um, 1985 is right in here. And so right at that point in time, that's about you know, you can kind of see that's almost like the fastest it's growing when we look at that model right there. It's it's growing at um, probably its fastest rate, maybe right in there, right in that time period. So it's gaining, uh, this population is gaining about 333 seals per year. Okay, and what if we wanted to know, well, what happens in 2000? Well, what is 2000? So 2000, of course, is... going to be 25 because 2000 minus the starting year 1975 gives us 25. So T equals 25 and we're going to plug that in to both the population and into the derivative to figure out the rate of change and what the population is. So plugging that in, take uh, 7,500 and divide by 1 plus 3.6875e to the negative 0 0.2 times 25. And I found, uh, plugged that into the calculator ahead of time. So let's see, we ended up with 7,300 and again, rounded it to a whole seal, 18 seals. So it is an approximation. So notice that it's getting pretty close to that carrying capacity, right? We, we had that carrying capacity of 7,500. And when I plug it into the derivative, 
take the 5,531.25e to the negative 0 0.2 times 25 and divide by 1 plus 3.6875e to the negative 0 0.2 times 25 all squared. I'm trying to write that kind of quickly because I plugged it into the calculator already. Plugging in 25 into that derivative and what we find is we get approximately 35 seals per year. So notice what's happening as more time has passed and that seal population has rebounded and hit its carrying capacity. We're growing still, but at a lower rate, at a slower rate, right? So in 1985, the seal population is growing about 333 seals per year. But by the time we get to January of 2000, the seal population has rebounded quite a bit and it's hit that 7,318 seals and it's only growing now at about 35 seals per year. Okay. And so there's examining a rate of change um, using um, a function, a logistic growth model, and, and just using our derivative skills in order to find the rates of change and then discuss them and talk about them.